The Tolkien Road, Episode 84, The Lord of the Rings, Treebeard, Part 1. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with the first part of Book 3, Chapter 4, Treebeard. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. John is here, and I'm joined by... My co-host, as always, Greta. What's up, what's up? Yeah, what's up? What is up, indeed? Yeah, I'm asking uh, the same question. What's up? What's new with you since last time? Oh, well... You got the sniffles. I do have the sniffles, which I was actually really bummed about for the last couple of days because yeah. I felt horrible, but then just last night, I discovered the best hot toddy recipe, and now I'm wishing that my cold would last longer, just so I have an excuse to keep drinking them. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, I mean, that makes sense to me. I it guess. makes sense to me, too. Yeah. I'm really actually kind of upset that I didn't think about making hot toddies until now. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like even though you're, you know, you get the flu and you're like, you're like barfing up and everything like that when you're a kid, you get to stay home from school. So it's like, yeah. it's kind of a, kind of a, you know, like watch yeah. TV. Yeah, that's you true. It's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, the Cubs are World Series champions, which they are. is pretty awesome. And we were up way too late watching that last night. Yes, and so were our children. Yeah. But, you know. So today has been a little bit of a crazy day. Um, yes, we have children regard. bursting into tears randomly and trying to kill each other for no reason. But hey, baseball is life, and, yep. um. They, and now that the season's over, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm just going to cry. Yeah, well, there's always next year. I know. Spring yeah. training starts in February, so we really just have, like, what, four months to get yeah. through? I'm just glad, you know, like, I'm really glad that they pulled it out. And, and it's not anything against the Cleveland Indians, because I kind of hope they win next year. Or the Orioles first, but then the Thank Indians. You. I was hoping you'd make that um, But, you know, it's like, man, like, it's just been so long for the Cubs, you know. I know. It's 108 like, years. It's got to be the almost, biggest drought. I almost thought they were actually cursed last night when that guy hit that. When, hit uh, the tie when, um, two run home run. What's his name? What's the guy's Davis. name? Davis. Davis, Rajay Davis, yeah. Mm-hmm. When he hit his when he hit his home run off of Chapman, who nobody had hit a home run nobody off of Nobody hits June. home runs off Chapman. <laughs> I know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I know. That was crazy sauce. Yeah. What but, a great game, though. What a great game seven. Yeah. Well, you know what's really cool? So so this is actually, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to draw this into Tolkien stuff a little bit. Um because our listeners are probably beginning to think they tuned into the wrong podcast. Right, right. Um, yeah, so Chris Bryant and Ben Zobrist are actually elves. So that's that's how I'm drawing it in. Ah, uh, it's all making sense now. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> um, the way I'm going to draw it in is, so if you watch the game, um, there was, so the, the Cubs were up like 6-1. to one, and, and I'm not going to go into all the history of why this was such a monumentally important game. Um, but... The Cubs were up like six, like six to one at one point, and they were. you know pretty deep into the game. And then the Indians fought back, and and eventually in the bottom of the eighth, with like four outs to go, the Indians tied it up on a two-run home run that was just like like what just happened. Yeah. And um, and so you're thinking to yourselves like, oh my gosh, the curse is real, and they're gonna lose. The Cubs are gonna lose. And um, and what happened was after the end of nine innings, the game was still tied, and there was a rain delay. Right. And they went back into the clubhouse, and one of the players, I think it was, was it Hayward? It was Hayward. Hayward. Yeah. One of the players gave a pep talk to the rest of his, to the rest of the Cubs, because you know, like the the pitcher who had given up the home run was like crying and like you know thinking he had he had ruined it for everyone, and like just what a horrible feeling. And there was just so many emotions in this game, and um, and Hayward says something to the effect of, guys. You know, we just need to go out there and keep doing what we've been doing all season. We're going to win this thing, and we're going to. And when we do win it, it's going to be that much sweeter because of what just happened. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of thinking about that in the context of like the Felix Culpo, the happy fault, oh, and um, yeah. which is like this, you know, kind of Catholic idea of original sin and the fall that um, really of the fall that Tolkien latched onto, and um, and and really kind of informed a lot of the uh, the the quality, like the just the the way he told the stories, you know, in his yeah. works. And I mean, it's a huge part of like yeah. just the whole story of the ring um, and, and, and everything associated with that, that, you know, you have all this, all these troubles they have to go through and all these like just dramatic moments. And why does it all happen? Well, you know, it's kind of this idea of the happy fault because in the end it's going to be that much more wonderful and beautiful when the triumph happens. Right. Amen. So, Anyway, well said. I wouldn't I wouldn't plan it on saying anything about that, but you yeah. know, we talked about you, you brought up the Cubs and yep. so I figured I'd talk about that since I felt it was kinda of Tolkien related. It's totally Tolkien related. Well yeah. done. All right. So chapter uh chapter four of book three. This is Treebeard. So we're gonna do yes. this one in two parts because it's long and there's a I I just you know, I feel like Treebeard kind of rebuked me personally. Like for being too hasty in this chapter and trying to make my way through the Lord of the Rings too quickly. Even though we're doing it chapter by chapter, I feel like sometimes we skip over a lot. And so I'm thinking about maybe even just slowing down a little bit and, you know, doing like half a chapter at a time or something like that. But we'll see. I mean, if it's a really short chapter, I probably won't do that. But if it's a longer one and there's mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff in mm -hmm. there, then yeah. why not take our time? You know? I hear you. Absolutely. Do the, do the wise tree beard thing. Mm -hmm. um, great idea. So, a couple of announcements I um, wanted to mention first. Um, so, uh, I have I have big news that is somewhat Tolkien related, um, but I have uh, and I've just wanted to share with you guys. I recently um, launched uh, a music project that I'm calling Pale Horse Sailor, and um, I released the first song for it, which is called Vingalot. Which what is? Do you remember what Vingalot is? It's a ship. Yes. In the Silmarillion. Right. That uh, what's his name? Somebody rides. Ar. Ar. Arrendale. Arrendale. Yes, Arindale. that Arrendale rides to the Blessed Realm. That's right. Yes. So I recently launched a music project, and that and the song Vingalot is the first song on there. You can you can go to TrueMyths.org and find a link to the song. Or you can go to PaleHorseSailor.BandCamp.com and you can listen to the song there. Um, but there's lots more to come, uh, and in in this project, it's not like, it's not, it's not going to be all like songs about Tolkien stuff, but it's it's very Tolkien inspired, and um, and kind of more in the sense of his philosophy and his mm. view of his just view of the world, right? And um, so I hope you'll check it out. I'm really excited to share it with everybody. It's very, it's just, you know, it comes it comes from the same place in my heart that this podcast has come from, and. Um, and so, you know, I hope it, I hope it, uh, hope, I hope you all give it a chance. And, um, if you like it, let me know. Yeah. You know? Right on. I need yeah. to go listen to it. I haven't heard it. Yeah. You've heard it. I've played it for you. I probably heard bit. it yeah. being practiced, but yeah. I don't know if I've heard or the being finished written. product. Yeah. 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 But there's like, this, this is the first, very first song from this project. Just wanted to put kind of a first one out there. And then I've got a collection of songs coming soon. A short collection of songs coming soon. So. Exciting. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, well, we, we heard from some folks um, oh, sweet. between last episode and now. I think so we'll that would be like one of the saddest days of my life when we sit down to do an episode and we haven't heard from anybody. Yeah, yeah, you know. I, I think mean, I'd probably cry um, if you refused to do the episode. Well, you heard, it, you heard it here. Don't make Greta mm -hmm. cry. It means you all need cry. to write into us. Yeah. Um, you don't want to just listen to John like blab on, so seriously. you need me here. Yeah, that guy's a total loser. <laughs> all right. Oh, did I say that out loud? Uh oh. Well, hey, you said it, yeah. not me. You know what? I'm thinking. I gotta open a window. I'm just. I'm, I'm yeah, no, I can see you here. sweating. Man. Uh, sorry, people. Like. So you know, what? What the heck? It's like November. What third? And it's still like eighty something degrees in Tennessee. I mean, goodness gracious. And we're in a drought. It was like a sauna in here. It is. It's really. I don't remember it being this warm in November. Huh? In October? And like in November? In November? No. Yeah. Not here. Goodness I remember gracious. being this warm in December, but I don't remember being this warm in November. That's true. We did have a really warm December yes, last, last year. Yes, last year we did. Like Christmas felt like it was the 4th of July. It did. We, didn't, we couldn't even have our ugly sweater party. I know. I know. It was too hot for sweaters. Who to thunk? It's 73 here in Tennessee And it, the sun right has now. set, so it's not going to get much cooler tonight. 
What gives, people? Global warming. Yeah. All right. Um, I thought they said it was going to rain and cool things off today. That didn't happen. Yeah. Oh, well. All if right. If everything suddenly goes silent, you'll know that we've passed just out passed from out. the stroke. Well, you know, you're also making me drink this hot coffee. I am. If you don't want yours, just don't No, I really like it, actually. It's really it. good, but it's probably making me hot. Probably just need to drink well, some Well, mine's not very water. hot anymore, so... I even mean, like your even your ice mug is sweating. Well, it always sweats. Well, I guess that's your compensation and all that. All right. Um, con- what? Hmm? Compensation. Condensation. I thought you said compensation. Please, I studied the water cycle. I know what the difference between compensation and condensation. And is. I don't eat meat because I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. Um. So Aaron, Aaron Tyson. Um, Aaron. Yeah, last time we didn't hear from him, we uh, I think we kind of gave him a hard time on the podcast about that. Oh, did we? Hear from him. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, it worked. Apparently, it worked. We're, we're, we're so just need to, you just need to lash out at people on our podcast and mm-hmm. make them feel guilty. I am all about that. That's right. Uh, like, be like, don't be this guy. <laughs> all right, hey Aaron. Uh, he says greetings again. I'm sorry I didn't submit haiku last week. I really wanted to, but had a really urgent task to do. Yeah, I'm sure you did. What could be more urgent than submitting haiku? That's what they all say. Oh, That's geez. what they all say. Unbelievable. <sighs> well, you know what? I give them a little bit of credit for actually sending something this week. Yeah. yeah the you're urgent ur- task. <laughs> the old urgent task. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. I, we're, we're, oh, just, no. we're kidding with we're you. We're totally right. kidding. Um... You didn't. You said that like you weren't. I know. I just realized that. <laughs> <laughs> now you just. Now I'm all confused. We just need to move on. All right. All right. Sorry, my hot potty's going to my head. <laughs> all right. Um, I, he says I wanted to say something in regard in regards to Caleb's comment about the Lord of the Rings musical. Oh. He says, I've so. I'll preface this by saying again, like Caleb. Uh, I liked the songs that you shared with us last week. But I told you, like, I'm not a fan of musicals normally. And right. Greta is. Greta I really likes musicals. musicals. But what? I feel like musicals are one of those things that, like, some people get and some mm-hmm. people don't. Like, mm-hmm. you either, like, love musicals or you're yeah. just like, I don't get it. Yeah. You know? There's not really any middle ground. Like, I remember, so, I love Spider-Man. And I love U2. Like, U2 is, I mean, you know, like, U2 oh, yeah. is one of my favorite bands, yeah. right? Uh, maybe my original favorite, like, favorite band. Uh, I've loved them since I was a little kid. So you two a couple of years ago did the soundtrack for the Spider Man musical, oh. right? And I had no interest in seeing it. Now you think loving Spider Man and loving you two, yeah, I want to go see this, but I heard about it and I was just like, why would I want to see that? That doesn't because it was a yeah. musical. You yeah, know? it was a musical. So yeah, I get that. You know, that. I'm not saying that um, there I can't that like it's not possible. It's just it's just one of those things where like I have this mental block against musicals yeah. or something yeah. like that. Um, it's him, not you. It's it's me, right? Yeah. Uh, because there's a lot of people that I respect. And love, and, and, and there's Greta, too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that I was, fall in a was, different category yeah. than respecting and loving. No. That's awesome. That, 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 <laughs> that joke didn't come off. I, 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 I know what you're getting at. Anyway, um, there's lots of people that I love and respect and, and that kind of thing that love musicals. Right. So, anyway. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Aaron says, uh, I've tried listening to it before, but personally I don't care for most of it. But however, there is one song in it that I absolutely love. It is called Now and For Always. Frodo and Sam sing it, and the whole idea of the song is taken from the conversation that Frodo and Sam have on the stairs of Kirith Ungle about being put into tales. It makes it makes me want to cry when I listen to it. Hmm. So if you listen to any of it, please listen to that one. All right, and then he gives us some haiku. So I'm not going to pull it up, but I encourage everybody to go, you know, to go listen to that. Now and, and um, always. Now and always, go check. You know what? Heck, why don't I just pull it up? We'll take, know, yeah, okay. we can listen to a bit of it. Yeah, so people can get a little idea for the flavor. Yeah. Little little sample. Right, but don't play all of it. We don't want to get sued. Alrighty. Where is it? Now and for always. Oh, now and for always. Okay. I'm not remembering this. I'm not calling to mind the scene. This is um. Uh, the steps of Kirithungal is like right before they get to um. Uh. To Shelob's. Lair, the spider, the giant spider's lair. We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. That's further in. Fast forward a little bit. It sounds like an intro. Slow but sure, fight our heart in blood. Your veins makes you proud. Sturdy and steady, they stop. True to their aim, 
to stay the same now and for always sit by the firelight's glow tell us an old tale we know tell of adventures strange and rare Alright, that, I mean, that yeah, sounds pretty lovely. nice, yeah. yeah. Sounds pretty beautiful. Um, yeah. So go check it out if, if, uh, if that sounds cool to you. Um, by the way, I thought, I just realized, if I'm going to play that, I might as well play a little snippet of, um, of Being a Lot. Oh, yeah. Um, so that people sure. can hear what it sounds like, if you want to. I want to. Alright. Um, here we go. So that's a little that's a little Ooh. taste of Vingalot for you. Nice. It is an instrumental, by the way, but um, but I think you know. I'm mean, using all on it, don't you? Well, I do. So there is that. Yeah, yeah. there are some lyrics, I guess, oh. technically speaking. Um, but so it is, it's mostly an instrumental, though. There's no like kind of like lyrics, lyrics that, right. that mean anything other than ah. Um, <laughs> but future songs will have lyrics. Um, many awesome. many of many lyrics written for other songs. So, but this one just oh. felt right without the lyrics. Um, so, um, all right, where were we? We were talking about Aaron. So Aaron yep. shared with us Now and For Always from yeah. the Lord of the Rings musical. Uh, we also heard from uh, Derek Otto. So Derek, um, Derek awesome. actually led his off with a haiku. And, I, and this is kind of a special haiku, so I want, to, I, want to, mm. I want to go ahead and read his haiku. All right. All right. Do it. Jerky is dried raw, cured with sugar, salt, and spice. Chewy and tasty. So, man, I want some jerky now. Yeah, me too. I actually had some for lunch. But it was <laughs> it was like the you know the Kirkland, Kirkland brand. It wasn't. I wonder if Derek would send us some. Maybe who knows? He makes his own, right? Yeah. I mean, only somebody that makes his own jerky would be able to write a haiku like that. Seriously, seriously. Well, it's in response to our conversation last week about like oh yeah the mystery the orc That's mystery right, meat right the orc mystery meat yeah yes and I was wondering how it could be raw and dried right yes okay. so so Derek wrote that haiku uh, which was a great way to start it and totally um, and then he said hello Carswell crew I've been listening to your podcast on my one plus hour commute to and from work and while working in my shop I'm hearing a theme from a lot of our our uh, listeners, listeners that they're like. I have a long commute, but I, I think I've said before that that's kind of what I had in mind when we started doing this mm -hmm. was like, I know there's lots of people with long commutes out there. I, yeah. I, you know, I sometimes have a long commute yeah. and it's nice to, you know, have something that you can just kind of sit back and yeah. be like, enjoy and just look forward to on that commute. Yeah, you know? that's true. That is true. Um, I've caught up to where I must wait until a new one comes out. Sad for me. I love listening to your insights into Tolkien as well as the friendly banter. You guys crack me up. Sometimes we crack ourselves up. Sometimes. Uh, yeah. I especially get tickled when the kids pop in and, and you have to play mom and dad. <laughs> it definitely happened last episode. Um, <laughs> your dried raw meat discussion prompted my haiku. I have made many pounds of jerky, and while you can dry it in the oven, I brine mine and dry it in a dehydrator. The temperature is too low to cook the meat, so it is raw when it is dry. The salt in the brine prevents bacteria growth. Other seasonings in the brine make it yummy. I love the stuff, so it doesn't last long around here. Thanks for putting out such an entertaining and informative podcast. Best wishes. Well, thanks, Derek, and yeah, thanks thank for you, educating Derek. us on the process of making jerky. I feel jerky. so much enlightened. Now. Yeah, well, now Greta's probably going to go make some because you know I don't have a dehydrator. 
Well, you probably want to get one now so you can make I some. I probably do. Yeah, because that's how you roll. Greta's a cook. You know, she's that's I do her like thing. To cook. Yeah. That's her thing. I don't know. I feel like the jerky might be out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, it might be. It might be. You never know until you try. True. I just might. I feel I like whatever you put your mind to do and when it comes to food, mm -hmm. you do a pretty darn good job of. Oh, well, thanks. But see, here's the thing. I can get like a pound plus at Costco for like 10 bucks. And that's like takes me a minute to put in my cart, not even. That's true. So, well, I'll think about it. Yeah. But but when you make your own jerky, you have the added bonus of knowing that you were a good sub creator. But true. True. But you know what Derek didn't mention was what kind of meat he uses. Does he use venison or beef? And like what cut, right? Do you mm -hmm. use a steak or do you use a shoulder? Do you use a loin? Man. Derek, we need you to write again, please. Answer my questions. Yeah. So you, you heard it there, Derek. There's your <laughs> question. That's your assignment for next time. <laughs> All right. Great hearing from you, Derek. Yes. Very uh, good. Then we got Mary Grace. Mary Grace. Uh, she left us a bunch of haiku, and uh, awesome. but she also said, I would like to sort of answer Greta's thoughts about the names of Sauron and Saruman. Cool. Both names come from the same Greek root, Sauros, meaning lizard, dragon, serpent. I learned this from reading an awesome book about the Hobbit called Bilbo's Journey and written by Joseph Pierce. It's an excellent read, and I highly recommend it. Yeah, we know, we know, we know good old Joseph, Joseph Pierce. Yeah. Um, uh, he's actually uh, been to our house once, had dinner with us yes. long, once upon a time. Yes. Yeah. True story. We talked about uh, Tolkien and stuff like that. So, you know. I think actually, when he was over for dinner, I think he had just finished writing that book. I think that one had been out for a while. I think he had a new one out that. Oh. But maybe I'm wrong. That might be that might be the case. Maybe but, that's uh, true. But yeah, that's great info. I didn't realize yeah, that. That is really good. I Thanks, didn't realize Mary that, Grace. Uh, Mary Grace. Yeah, I'll stop cool. complaining about them being too similar. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that they would be related somehow. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here, and then um, and then we heard from Rat Rob, who uh, I think we also missed last week. So we were we gave him a hard time too. I think, but uh. he's back. <laughs> I'm glad it makes um, a difference. So he says, uh, Dear John and Greta, Treebeard is possibly my favorite chapter in all of the books. Mm. Not only does it give some much-needed comic relief after the last chapter, it also introduces my favorite characters in the books, Ents. Mm -hmm. Much uh, much like the Hobbits, the Ents are lovers of nature and peace, but they are overlooked. Saruman sees the Ents as beneath his concern, and that is his downfall. Much the same way Sauron's downfall comes from overlooking Hobbits. Um, mm -hmm. Great insight. That's a yeah, really good insight. Really good insight. Yeah. Um, yeah, the it's interesting that that ants and hobbits, as different as they are, have that in common, right? Is that they're both kind of overlooked, yeah, yeah. you know, by the great powers. Yeah, um, I hadn't thought of that, but it makes total sense. Yeah, it really does. That's really cool. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks. All right, man. Like we're learning all kinds of awesome stuff from our listeners. This is amazing. It's great. I feel so much smarter. It's fantastic. You know, I really did enjoy this chapter as well. Mm -hmm. But you know what I was thinking about as I was reading because like. We compared, right, the length of this one, of, of Treebeard, tree to mm -hmm. Riders of Rohan. Yeah. Um, and this one's actually longer, right? Oh, fan. Did you turn this off? I didn't touch it. I oh. can't reach that high. Hopefully it's not going to be too loud. Well, it'll be some nice ambient noise. We could always talk Maybe. louder if we have yeah, to. Yeah, we could talk a little louder. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, was Treebeard, Treebeard is actually a longer chapter than Riders of Rohan. Yeah. But it did not feel that as long to me as Riders of Rohan did. Yeah. I think I just enjoyed it more overall. I think, you know, this this chapter for me, there's a lot of, this is another one of those chapters that's really what I love so much about Tolkien, and it's that sense of, like, uh, of just so much history, and so many things yeah. that you're just like, you know, there's something under, you, there's something under every rock, right? There's mm -hmm. some, there's some something under every rock, and it has a story in Lord of the Rings, and, um, this is one of those chapters where I think Tolkien really does a great job of achieving that that literary effect. Agreed. Um, you know, just your imagination just goes wild with this oh, chapter. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's beautiful in that way. Yeah. All right, chapter four, um, Treebeard. So let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so into the forest. Um, so we left off last time with Merry and Pippin escaping the Urukai. Right. Um, as they were getting attacked by the Rohirrim. And they run into Fangorn, right. and uh, in order to escape them, and so they keep running for a little bit, and uh, before long they realize that they're probably safe 
and um, and so they kind of slow down and they and they take a moment to kind of get their bearings. Uh, and I wanted to read this description, Pippin's description of of Fangorn. Yes, it is all very dim and stuffy in here," said Pippin. "It reminds me somehow of the old room in the great place of the Tooks, away back in the Smeals at Tuckborough, a huge place where the furniture has never been moved or changed for generations." They say the old Took lived in it year after year, while he and the room got older and shabbier together. And it has never been changed since he died a century ago. And old Grontius was my great-great-grandfather. That puts it back a bit. But that is nothing to the old feeling of this wood. Look at all those weeping, trailing beards and whiskers of, of lichen. I think that's how you say that. Lichen. Uh, lichen, is it? I don't know. I okay. just want to make that precise And most of the trees seem to be half-covered with ragged, dry leaves that have never fallen. Untidy. I can't imagine what spring would look like here if it ever comes. Still less the spring cleaning. Um, so the thing that they notice most about Fangorn is that it's old, right? It's just mm -hmm. you know, it just has this really old feeling to yeah, it. Yeah, like ancient, um, stuffy. Yeah. Uh, Mary goes on and says, "But the sun, at any rate, must peep in sometimes. It does not look or feel at all like Bilbo's description of Mirkwood. That was all dark and black, and the home of dark black things. This is just dim and frightfully treeish." You can't imagine animals living here at all or staying for long. No, nor hobbits, said Pippin. And I don't like the thought of trying to get through it either. Nothing to eat for a hundred miles, I should guess. How are our supplies? So, you know, the thing they realize about Fangorn is that it would seem it's just really a place for trees and plants. It, yeah. it doesn't really seem to be much room for support animals. Or, yeah. or, or, you know, animals of any sort. Right, right, right. yeah. Um, it really just seems to be a home for... Uh, you know, for trees and plants. Foliage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and grass. But it's not, it's not like Mirkwood, you know, it's not, it's not this completely dark place. Um, there is, there is kind of the room for sunlight and as the sun comes up, I think, you know, uh, they start to see a little bit more of its beauty, uh, you know, the beauty that's all its own. Right. Um, they, they try to climb it, they, they find a tree they decide to climb and they, to, in order to get a better look. And, um, Something kind of funny happens. Um, they they climb up on this they climb up on this tree, and Pippin says, "I'm afraid this is only a passing gleam, and it will all go gray again. What a pity! This shaggy old forest looks so different in the sunlight. I almost felt like I liked the place." And at that point, they hear this voice um, that you know startles them. You want to start reading there? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Almost felt like. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Should I do my tree tree beard voice? Uh, you better, I mean, yeah, I guess. It's yeah, Treebeard speaking. Almost felt you liked the forest. That's good. That's uncommonly kind of you, said a strange voice. Turn around and let me have a look at your faces. I almost feel that I dislike you both, but do not let us be hasty. Turn around. A large knob-knuckled knob hand was laid on each of their shoulders, and they were twisted round, gently but irresistibly. Then two great arms lifted them up. Yeah. So, it turns out they're looking at uh, what's described as a large, man-like, almost troll-like figure, at least 14 feet high, very sturdy, with, very sturdy, with a tall head and hardly any neck. Um, it, you know, and they can't tell whether, really whether it's clad in this kind of bark-like stuff or whether that's actually its hide. Um, Hmm. And, um, uh, but, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's kind of like a tree man. Right. Right. It has like its arms and feet and yeah. eyes. Yeah. Uh, so they're face to face with this seemingly powerful tree man. And I really want to highlight that little bit about them getting twisted around gently, but irresistibly. And I think, cause I think that kind of describes the power of the ants mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe the power of trees too. Um, you know, it's, it's like. You think about trees and like how how just like strong like we have this huge oak tree in our backyard and it's like it's just so big and there's so much weight there that has to be held up yeah. by that trunk yeah and you know like you think of like the roots that, like even even like you know sometimes I'll come up like we had these things in our yard called privets yeah and like they're little basically hedges and those things are so annoying because they grow up everywhere and they and they kind of get in your way. And, but if you let them go for too long, they're almost like impossible yeah. to get away without yeah. like some heavy machinery. And, um, but to me, that's like that, you know, that slow, but like irresistible power, like that describes the power of like this net, like this natural power of trees and apparently events as well. 
Um, so Mary and Pippin um, look into the eyes, and they're described um, uh, they're described as follows. Let's see. The lower part of the long face was covered with a sweeping gray beard, bushy, almost twiggy at the roots, thin and mossy at the ends. But at the moment, the hobbits noticed little but the eyes. These deep eyes were now surveying them, slow and solemn, but very penetrating. They were brown, shot with a green light. Often afterwards, Pippin tried to describe his first impression of them. One felt as if there was an enormous well behind them, filled up with ages of memory and long, slow, steady thinking. But their surface was sparkling with the present. Like sun shimmering on the outer leaves of a vast tree, or on the ripples of a very deep lake. I don't know, but it felt as if something that grew in the ground, asleep you might say, or just feeling itself as something between uh, root, t root tip and leaf tip, between deep earth and sky, had suddenly waked up and was considering you with the same slow care that it had given to its own inside affairs for endless years. I really like that description of, of the eyes, you know, that there was mm -hmm. this, um, they're just kind of surveying them slow and solemn, but, but penetrating. Uh, and there's this kind of green light behind them. Um, and there's like this pool, it's almost, it's almost like they're the, you know, there's this pool of memory in these eyes. Um, I just think that's a really beautiful description of you know what it was like yeah. to look into the ents, ents eyes, mm -hmm. and you know for all the age, you know, and all the things they've lived through, I agree. Um, through the world. Yeah, because they've been around a long time. Yes, they have. Which we'll yeah. learn, right? We'll learn more about their history. Absolutely, they have been around for a long time. Um, let's see. So um, they they make introductions. Pippin, Mary, and we find out that the Ent is named Treebeard, um, or Fangorn. So his name is literally in in one language. And I think it's I think his name is in I think it's in Sindar, and his name is um, Fangorn. Let me double check Isn't that. Isn't that the name of the forest? Well, that's the interesting thing, right? Is that the forest is named after him? It would seem, right? Oh yeah. Um. So yeah, Fangorn means Fangorn literally means beard of tree in Sindar. Huh. Um. So, uh, that's where Treebeard's name comes from. Interesting. So, we learn that's his name, and Mary and Pippin have never heard of Ents. So, Mary says, an Ent, what's that? And But what do you call yourself? What's your real name? Treebeard says, who now? Who, now that would be telling. Not so hasty. And I am doing the asking. You are in my country. What are you, I wonder? I cannot place you. You do not seem to come in the old list that I learned when I was young. But that was a long, long time ago, and they may have made new lists. Let me see. Let me see. How did it go? Learn now the lore of living creatures. First name the four, the free peoples. Eldest of all, the elf children. Dwarf, the delver, dark are his houses. Ent, the earthborn, old as mountains. Man, the mortal, master of horses. Hmm. Beaver the Builder, Buck the Leaper, Bear, Bee Hunter, Boar the Fighter, Hound is Hungry, Hare is Fearful, hmm. Eagle and Irie, Ox and Pasture, Hart Horn Crowned, Hawk is Swiftest, Swan the Widest, Serpent Coldest, Hmm, Hmm, How did it go? Room Tum, Room Tum, Room Ti Tum Tum. It was a long list. But anyway, you do not seem to fit in anywhere. You, you were laughing at my... I was. My it was very good. Approach. It's very good. I you like it. you got to read it slowly, though. That's the thing. Like, you know, it's, you know, with That's the voice. That's true. So I even found myself rushing sometimes. So, was, you know, you got to slow it down. That was very well done. Um, so Pippin, you know, the hobbits don't show up any, anywhere. And again, it's just, it's that other, it's another little indication that here are the hobbits just... They're overlooked being by everybody. Overlooked, yep. You know, yep. Um, not being put in the lists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Pippin proposes a new line. He says, "Half-grown hobbits, the hole dwellers." Um, and he says, "Put us in amongst the four, next to man, the big people, and you've got it." Hmm. Not bad. Not bad. That would do. So you live in holes, eh? It sounds very right and proper. Who calls you hobbits, though? That does not sound elvish to me. Elves made all the old words. They began it. So now Treebeard is just trying to learn as much as he can about, you know, about the hobbits yeah, and uh, where curious. they came from. Yeah. Uh, 
So um, Barry and Pippin tell them some, uh, tell Treebeard some about themselves, and um, Treebeard decides that once he learns a little bit about them, he wants to know what's going on in the wide world because right. apparently it would seem that Treebeard just kind of when he's not when nothing big is going on. What? Turn the, turn the fan down. I feel like I'm about to get blown away. Oh. Thank you. All right. So Treebeard wants to know what's been going on in the world right. around him. Uh, so they're pretty secluded there yeah. in the forest. Yeah, they just, they really don't, um, you know, they, they just, we'll get to it, we'll get to a part later where he says, um, you know, he basically says of what concern is all of the goings on in the world about right. me. I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on my own side. Right. You know? Right. We're very independent. He's like, I'm not on anybody's side because nobody's on my side. That's right. That seems like a very tree-ish way like of thinking. very tree way of thinking. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I do want to mention this part where he says, speaking of Ents speaking, he says, what are you doing in it all? After, as, as he says what is going on, he says, what are you doing in it all? I can see and hear and smell and feel a great deal from this, from this, from this alala lala rumba commanda leaned or burume. Excuse me, that is a part of my name for it. I do not know what the word is in the outside languages. You know, the thing we are on, where I stand and look out on fine mornings and think about the sun and the grass beyond the, world, the wood and the horses and the clouds and the unfolding of the world. What is going on? What is Gandalf up to? And these barrow room, he made a deep rumbling noise. Barrow room. He made a deep rumbling noise. Sorry. Barrow room. Better. He made a deep rumbling noise like a discord on a great organ. These orcs and young Saruman down at Isengard. I like news, but not too quick now. I like that he refers to him as young Saruman. You know, he Did refers he to Saruman as oh, young he's Saruman. Young. Yeah, well, he remembers him as being young. And in the world of Middle Earth, he's young compared to yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Um. And and so Merry and Pippin kind of start to fill him in. They don't go into too much detail, but they do inform him that Gandalf. Uh, is no longer part of the story. Um, you speak of Master Gandalf as if he was in a story that had come to an end. Yes, we do, said Pippin sadly. The story seems to be going on, but I am afraid Gandalf has fallen out of it. Who, come now, said Treebeard. Whom, ah well. He paused, looking, looking long at the hobbits. Hmm, well, I do not know what to say. Come now. Um, so, at this point... Um, Treebeard invites them back to, um, basically back to his home so that they can learn more about, you know, about him mm -hmm. and he can learn more about what's going on in the world right. around them. Right. Um, but apparently Treebeard knew who Gandalf was. Yeah. Treebeard yeah. had some awareness of Gandalf and Saruman, all these, all these folks. And so Treebeard isn't, isn't so old that he doesn't, you know, it's not like Treebeard has been asleep for the entire third age so far. Right. He does right. know about the wizards and um and he recognizes Gandalf as you know the only wizard that really cares about the trees that gives you know any concern for them oh that's right yeah uh, we'll get to that in just a moment um so Treebeard picks up Merry and Pippin and is kind of carrying them along as they mm -hmm. travel towards his you know one of Treebeard's homes in the forest mm -hmm. and um and Pippin asks him why he says why did Celeborn warn us against your forest he told us not to risk getting entangled in it Treebeard says hmm did he now why don't you go ahead and read this so you know where I am you're doing such a good job with your Treebeard voice you want me to keep doing Treebeard voice I'll try doing Treebeard right. Treebeard voice better hmm did he now rumbled Treebeard no I might have said much the same if you had been going the other way do not risk getting entangled in the woods of Lorelindornan. That is what the elves used to call it, but now they make the name shorter. Lothlorien, they call it. Perhaps they are right. Maybe it is fading, not growing. Land of the Valley of Singing Gold, that was it, once upon a time. Now it is the dream flower. Oh, well, but it is a queer place, and not just anyone to venture in. 
I am surprised that you ever got out, but much more surprised that you ever got in. That has not happened to strangers for many a year. It is a queer land. And so is this. Folk have come to grief here. Aye, they have. To grief. Lord Lindor non. Lindil or no door. Malin or Leon. Or no Lee Malin. He hummed to himself. They are falling rather behind the world in there, I guess, he said. Neither this country nor anything else outside the Golden Wood is what it was when Celeborn was young. Still, am I totally... You want to try it? Yes. Let's see. Toroli Lomae, Toroli Lomae, Tumba La Morna, Tumba La Torea, Lomanor. That is what they used to say. Things have changed, but it is still true in places. So lots of long words. So I want to I want to pause there because there's a little footnote. I don't know if it has this footnote in yours, but it has the footnote, but yeah. it doesn't have the appendix. Oh well, the, the appendix is in Return of the King. Oh, the of the King. got it. Okay. So um, if you open, if you go to the appendix F in Return of the King, and you look under other races in there, it talks about Ents. And appendix F is all in the languages of uh, the peoples of the Third Age. So if you look at the Ents. Um, here's what it says. The most ancient people surviving in the Third Age were the Onodrim, or, or Onodrim, or uh, Enid. Ent was the form of their name in the language of Rohan. They were known to the, elder, to the Eldar in ancient days, and to the Eldar, indeed, the Ents ascribed not their own language, but the desire for speech. The language that they had made was unlike all others. Slow, sonorous, agglomerated, repetitive, indeed long-winded formed of a multiplicity of vowel shades and distinctions of tone and quality which even the masters of the Eldar had not attempted to represent in writing. They used it only among themselves, but they had no need to keep it secret, for no others could learn it. Ents were, however, themselves skilled in tongues, learned them swiftly and never forgetting them, but they preferred the languages of the Eldar and loved best the ancient High Elven tongue. The strange words and names that the hobbits record as used by Treebeard and other Ents are thus elvish, or fragments of elf speech, strung together in Ent fashion. Some are Quenya, as Tarololomae, Tumbale Morna, Tumbala Torie, Lomeanor, which may be rendered Forest Many, Shadowed, Deep Valley Black, Deep Valley Forested, Gloomy Land, and by which Treebeard meant more or less. There is a black shadow in the deep dales of the forest. Some are Sindarin, as Fangorn, Beard of Tree, or Fembrethil, Slender Beach. So, you know, that's just a little bit about, you know, why the Ents have all these long words. It's interesting that they're basically, the long words are typically, you know, Quenya words that are strung together. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so just a, you know, little interesting footnote yeah. about, about the Ents. Totally. Um... So, um, so literally what, you know, what, um, Treebeard was saying right there is, once again, bring it up, here we go, um, he says, forest many, shadow deep valley black, deep valley forested gloomy land, and means there is a black shadow in the deep dales of the forest. So, that's what Treebeard's getting at, as he says all this. Um... Yep. Dark All right. times. What's that? Dark times. Dark times. Indeed. Um, so Pippin says, what do you mean? What is true? Treebeard says, the trees and the ents. I do not understand all that goes on myself, so I cannot explain it to you. Some of us are still true ents, and lively enough in our fashion. But many are growing sleepy, going treeish, as you might say. Most of the trees are just trees, of course. But many are half awake. Some are quite wide awake, and a few are, well, uh, well, getting entish. That is going on all the time. When that happens to a tree, you find that some have bad hearts. Nothing to do with their wood. I do not mean that way. Why, I knew some good old willows down the entwash. Gone long ago, alas. 
They were quite hollow. Indeed, they were falling all to pieces, but as quiet and sweet-spoken as a young leaf. And then there are some trees in the valleys under the mountains, sound as a bell, and bad right through. That sort of thing seems to spread. They were used to be, there used to be some very dangerous parts in this country. There are still some very black patches. Like the old forest away to the north, do you mean? asked Mary. Aye, aye, something like, but much worse. I do not doubt there is some shadow of the great darkness lying there still away north, and bad memories are handed down. But there are hollow dales in this land where the darkness has never been lifted, and the trees are older than I am. Still, we do what we can. We keep off strangers and the foolhardy, and we train and we teach, we walk and we weed. We are tree herds, we old ants. Few enough of us are left now. Sheep get like shepherd, and shepherds like sheep, it is said. But slowly and neither have long in the world. It is quicker and closer with trees and ants, and they walk down the ages together. For ants are more like elves, less interested in in themselves than men are, and better at getting inside other things. And yet again, ants are more like men, more changeable than elves are, and quicker at taking the color of the outside, you might say. Or better than both. For they are steadier and keep their minds on things together, on things longer. Um, So we learn, you know, we learn a good bit about Ents there and the different forests of the world. And, you know, we're reminded and, you know, that the Ents were these creatures created um, to protect, you know, the the living things, the growing things, right? From dwarves. What's that? From dwarves. From dwarves in particular, right? Yeah. Uh, we go back to you know chapter two and the mm-hmm. Silmarillion of Ali and Yavanna, or yep. Ali and Yavanna, and Ali creates the dwarves, and in response, Yavanna, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, works with Manwe to create both uh, the eagles mm-hmm. and um, the ants. Yes. Right. Yep. So uh, the ants are, are a product of Yavanna's work, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, their job is to. You know, take care of the trees and protect all the forests yeah. of the Which world. Yeah, interesting because the ants, compared to the dwarves, it's it's it just struck me how natural the ants are. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, they're of nature. Right? right. It's like that thing that that uh, we talked about in the last episode, episode before about Tolkien. I think it was about um, we were talking about orcs versus elves mm-hmm. and how. Um, it was almost like Tolkien's way of, um, of, of, of kind of bringing out the fact that, you know, when you enhance the natural nature, the nature, the inherent nature of something, right. as opposed to trying to work against it, it's, you know, it's, the elves obviously are a beautiful result of that. Mm-hmm. It works when you're trying to distort that. That's the result. Right. right. When you're distorting. Anyway, so that just struck me because the dwarves obviously were like, you know, Alley's little side project that mm-hmm. was kind of a distortion a bit of nature. Well, it not was like, more maybe like... Maybe not distortion, but it was still not yeah. a natural... Yeah, it wasn't a distortion in the way that orcs were. It was more like Alley's... Alley was just hasty, which is interesting right. now that I think about it because yeah, Alley was, was being impatient. hasty. Yeah. He was being impatient because he wanted... You know the Valar kind of looked upon the children, the coming children of Iluvatar, as like their little brothers and sisters. Right. And and they wanted to share all of this stuff with them, but they you know it took a long time for them to show up, and so Ali grew hasty. Right. And decided to take matters into his own hands and made the dwarves. Yeah. Um, it also strikes me. So I'm sorry. Did you did you want to finish? Your no, thought? no, no. I was okay. just going to say it just struck me as kind of how just as getting us that natural versus unnatural. Mm-hmm. Paradigm, right? right? Whereas the ants are more, you know, they're of nature. They're more natural, yeah, than the dwarves are, right? Like they were created to protect things from the dwarves, among others. But anyway. Absolutely, absolutely, um, yeah. Um, and, and and as I think about it, it also strikes me that in a way, dwarves and ants are similar because they they weren't they're not the children of Iluvatar, but they have a lot of the qualities. They have, they seem to be kind of have the same kind of like free, free will and everything that the children of mm-hmm. Iluvatar have. Yeah, and they're a big part, and they're they're free actors, right? In in that story, and yes, um, 
but they're also very, they're both very mysterious, right? Like, yeah, that's true. You know, we just don't know yeah. a lot about them and, and their culture, and they they kind of they they tend to view the world as like no one's on my side. I just you know if if you're um, if you're willing to be in a cause that um, that helps me, then I'll join you. But yeah. if not, then you know leave me out of it. Almost you know kind of approach. Kind yeah, of approach that's a good things. that's a good point. Yeah. That's so it's interesting to think that they both can kind of come from the same the same episode mm-hmm. you know they're a product of the same episode and maybe wouldn't exist if it weren't for the other you know very yeah I like that anyway yeah it's very insightful um so yeah the ants are the the tree herds the tree shepherds um all right um I can I ask about something yeah real go quick? ahead I wasn't quite sure because tree bird just talked a lot tree bird tree beard just talked a lot about kind of he drew this um, distinction mm-hmm. between entish and treeish, and which obviously he's making the point that I mean obviously ants are trees, right? But they're a special form of trees. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just interesting, and I'm not quite sure what my question is. But he almost spoke of he he's basically gave the impression that these ants that have turned tree-ish mm-hmm. that was a bad thing yeah. right and that was better for trees to be turning entish mm-hmm. you know what I'm trying to say like what what is that distinction that he's trying to make and is it significant um yeah he seems to be so you're saying is it better to become for an ant to become tree-ish or for a tree to well, become no, I think he's. I think it's clear that he's speaking out against ants becoming tree-ish mm-hmm. right but I'm not quite sure the difference that he like. What is he? What is the difference between an ent, entish and treeish? What is? Yeah. What are those? Well, and, and mean? treeish would mean like it just stays in place and doesn't move and doesn't and it just it it's doesn't a tree. do anything. Yeah, it has no movement, no free will, no right. desire to yeah. act in any way. Yeah, and and entish would be that it's the opposite, right? That it's awakening and it's acting like a. Uh, you know, like a like a tree herd, like it's it's acting as a guardian and a okay. shepherd okay. of the trees. Okay. Um, that's what that's the way I understand it. Yeah. You know? So okay. it's a it would be bad for an ant to become like a tree because that's not what an ant's supposed to be. It's supposed to be acting more like a shepherd and being kind of looking out on the world and saying like, okay, how do I protect mm. the forest? Okay. Right. Yeah. Makes that's sense. how I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. Good. Thanks. All right. Well, we um, I wanted to just hit this uh, hit Treebeard song here, um, and then I think that'll be the last thing we cover in this episode. Okay. Um. Let's see. Do you want to, Do you want to give it a shot? Uh, sure. Okay. So, is, like, does he just kind of? Is there any? kind of uh should we set this up in any way like or does he just break into well he's just walking and um he began to hum, he begins to hum so they finished up their conversation um about you know they've been talking about the ants and uh those kinds of things he says those were the broad days um he says so we'll, we'll note this too um some of my trees are limb lithe and many can talk to me Elves began it, of course, waking trees up and teaching them to speak and learning their tree talk. Oh yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so that the is interesting. We should mention that. Actually, trained them to speak. It sounds right. Like. Yeah. Yeah, um, it would seem so. Even though the ants, it would seem, were awake before the elves. Yeah. The elves were the ones that developed language, and it said that in that little appendix uh, piece from the appendix oh, that's right. yeah. about the ants, right? That the elves taught them to speak. Which is why their words are the. Or Quenya, or like Quenya strung right, together. Quenya yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, the elves always wished to talk to everything, the old elves did. But then the great darkness came, and they passed away over the sea, or fled into far valleys, and hid themselves, and made songs about days that would never come again. Never again. Aye, aye, there was all one wood once upon a time, from here to the mountains of Loon, and this was just the east end. That's really interesting to think about, that there was this once yeah. this great forest... Over this whole, you know, region of Middle Earth. And now it's not there anymore. Those were the broad days. Time was when I could walk and sing all day and hear no more than the echo of my own voice in the hollow hills. 
The woods were like the woods of Lothlorien, only thicker, stronger, younger. And the smell of the air. I used to spend a week just breathing. Treebeard fell silent, striding along, and yet making hardly a sound with his great feet. Then he began to hum again and passed into a murmuring chant. Gradually, the hobbits became aware that he was chanting to them. So do you want to read it? Do you want me to? Sure, okay. Right. In the willow meads of Tasarnan, I walked in the spring. Ah, the sight and the smell of the spring in Natarsion. And I said, that was good. I wandered in summer in the elm woods of Osirion. Ah, the light and the music in the summer by the seven rivers of Osir. And I thought, that was best. To the beaches of Neldorath, I came in the autumn. Ah, the gold and the red and the sighing of leaves in the autumn in Tar Neldor. It was more than my desire. To the pine trees upon the highland of Dorthonion, I climbed in the winter. Ah, the wind and the whiteness and the black branches of winter upon Orod Nathion. My voice went up and sang in the sky, and now all those lands lie under the wave, and I walk in Ambarnana, in Tarimorna, in Alonine, in my own land, in the country of Fangorn, where the roots are long, and the years lie thicker, than the leaves in Tarimor Nanamore. Alright. I'm sorry, I probably didn't pronounce those very well. So I just kept going. <laughs> That's alright. That was, it was good. Um, and those are tough words to pronounce. Um, so, you know, he's talking about here how once upon a time he, he walked in the lands of Beleriand, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. that he, in the lands of the First Age, he used to walk in those lands, right? Yeah. Uh, but now they lie under the waves, right? Um, you know, there's something almost that seems like, um, like, like, ents to me seem very elvish, but almost like, um, like elves, elves without a fallen nature almost. Like, you know, like, you know, elves without uh, the ability to get, like, hot-tempered or something like that. Like, I, I don't know, there's just, there's something very elvish about them, but they seem very contemplative. Like, you know, they're just they like... They do. Yeah, very you know, philosophical, very thoughtful. Right. He yeah. just he just walks around and he says, and I thought that was good. and I, Or I said that was good, and I thought that was best. It was more than my desire. And he yeah. kind of ends it all with, now all those lands lie under the wave, and I walk in Ambarona, and Tare Morna, and Alda Lome, in my own land, in the country of Fangorn, where the roots are long and the years lie thicker than the leaves, in Tare Mornalome. So, uh, I mean, it's beautiful. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that you know little poem there. Um, but you get this sense of something we've talked about on this show before: the long defeat. You know, which was an important Tolkienian concept that yeah. Treebeard kind of looks at the world through this lens of like all that was once good is is fading and and dying away and um and you know he's just kind of fighting this long defeat um and he's kind of accepted it yeah. for what it is yeah um and he'll do good as long as he can but it is it is a long defeat yeah yeah he's realistic about it yeah yeah oh. all right any other thoughts so we're pausing there and we'll pick up with we'll probably do the rest of the chapter next episode um, any yeah. other thoughts on that one? I don't think so. I mean, it's all right. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing the rest of it. Yeah, me too. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Absolutely. There um, is. yeah. So since we are all done with that, that means that it oh, is that's right. Like time. Are we gonna sing? Yeah, we are. Together? Or are we gonna switch back and forth? Uh, together. Can yeah. we go first or you? You. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 8, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables in haiku. Nice. Ooh. We're doing kind of the tone deaf version, though. I think we need to actually sing it with some melody next time. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah. 7, 8, 9, Harmonize. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Roboto. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, all right, haiku time. Haiku time. You want to go? You want to go first or me? Well, here's my question. Yeah. I wrote two haiku, uh-huh. and both of them are focused on more of the latter part of the chapter that we didn't discuss today. Okay. So I'm wondering if I should just defer. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. Maybe I'll look through and see. We'll kind of look at them first and see if we think we should defer that one for all of our listeners. But if you. If you don't have one, you think if you have if you think it would make more sense to do the haiku next time, we can wait till next time. I think mine would. Yeah. Um, just because. Well, you know, I have one that we could I could probably do today. Okay. How about you? Uh, I can right? probably do both. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, do you want to read yours? Sure. All right. Lost and on the run. Hobbits receive wise counsel. Don't be so hasty. Mm. Good. I like it. And I'll do my other one. Ere the Eldar awoke. Sorry, let me try that again. Ere the Eldar awoke, by Yavanna's green hand, it's great forest shepherds. Ooh, I like that. Forest shepherds. It's good. Very nice. I like Thank them you. both very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Go right ahead. I'm going to say mine for next time. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right, mine were just so dazzling they and were. glorious. I just can't compete. All righty. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So I'm going to I'm gonna go through the ones that were submitted and just think, would that be good for this time or next time? Um, okay. Let's see. I think Aaron's both might be good for next time. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Um. Let's see. Mm. Mary Grace, she wrote three, but I think they all are, are right for next time. I think they are too. And then Josh. Oh, good, Josh. Yeah. Um, let's see. He wrote he wrote a funny one, but it really is more appropriate for next time. Um, uh, oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, here we go. The second one from Josh is, is appropriate for this one, I think. So from Josh. As the green world recedes... So too do the ancients of the world, the Ents. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. Nice. Very nice. And we got Rob's. Um, Rob. Uh, I think his, his are probably both good for next time as well. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's what I get for you know surprising everybody and breaking it into two episodes. Yeah. Seriously. But if there's others out there who want to submit haiku for this chapter, um, just, I guess, do so before next Wednesday, which would be, let's see, the 9th. Yep. Yeah, do so before next Wednesday, the 9th, and we'll try to get you on that episode for this chapter. That yeah. sounds great. So. Yeah. So be sure, if you already sent them, they will get read. Yeah, we'll, we'll get read. Yeah, they will we'll, get read. So thank you for submitting the ones you yes. have. We'll, we'll definitely read those on the next one. I just didn't want to, since we didn't cover the latter half of the chapter... I didn't want to do the haiku that really apply more or that make more sense in the context of that. Right, right. So. Yep. Yeah. All right. I agree. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we will talk at you next time. Yes, we will. All right. All right. Bye. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll finish our discussion of this chapter. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.